Uh, welcome everyone to this vital conversation on feminist crisis response hosted by Feminist Alchemy. Uh, my name is Siwa Ardus. I am Feminist Crisis Response Manager at Global Fund for Women, and I'm honored to be facilitating today's discussion. Please choose your preferred language by clicking at the globe icon for the interpretation below. Uh, interpretation is available in Swahili, Spanish, French, and English. It's inspired to have all of you here today as we launch this important research, a feminist um, a blueprint for feminist crisis response. This research was conducted through a collaborative participatory approach by Feminist Alchemy, which is a diverse community of feminist funds working together to shape a better feminist crisis response. The blueprint sets out to articulate a collective understanding uh, of uh, really like a collective understanding of what it means to respond to crisis with a feminist lens. This research not only helps us to identify the unique feminist funders and activists uh, role that they play in the humanitarian crisis setting, but also invites funders, philanthropists, and the broad humanitarian community to adopt intersectional feminist practices and their responses. Together, we aim um, really we aim to increase the support for feminist crisis response while ensuring we push for deeper systematic changes across sectors. In a world where marginalized communities bear the brunt of a uh, crisis, it's a crucial that we increase advocacy for feminist approaches, which center on care, collaboration, and participatory methods. The session will explore these themes and more uh, with incredible insights for our esteemed panelists. Each of these leaders brings a wealth of knowledge and experience from their regions and respective respective organizations, helping to ground this research and live the experience and practical wisdom. We're delighted and honored to be um, joined by uh, Tina Lubawu, who is gender equality and social inclusion advocate and partnership manager at UHAI. Uh, UHAI works at the intersection of LGBTI rights and sex worker advocacy in Africa, emphasizing inclusive participatory funding models as first indigenous activist fund for and by LGBTI people and sex workers. Honored to have you, Tina. Uh, we also are honored to have Muna Ukarel from Tiwa, who has spent her career strengthening women's grassroots movements in Nepal, fostering resilience and independence for women's NGOs. Tiwa was the first women's fund in Asia. Um, and we're also honored to be uh, to have Susan. Masabi, who is an Iranian feminist and rights activist and exclusive and the executive director for FEBENA, whose work in the Swana region amplifies the voices of women, human rights defenders, and feminist movements, even in the face of authoritarianism and conflict. And uh, last but not least, we're so thrilled to have Lourdes Contreras, uh, who is a Peruvian feminista, comunitaria, coordinator at World March of Women. Uh, Macronerte, where they are building an anti-patriarchal, anti-colonial, and anti-capitalist movement that stands for women, nature, and the LGBTQI plus community. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to sharing the findings from the research and exploring how we can continue to wave feminist approaches and to crisis response across the world that is in crisis. We can dive into the conversation and please feel free to share your thoughts and questions in the Q&A box as we go along. I want to pass it to my uh, my dear colleague, Bea, who is coordinating and facilitating Feminist Alchemy, so she can tell us a bit about the story of Feminist Alchemy. Bea, over to you. Thank you, Siwar. Uh, very excited to be here today and to have such an amazing panel with us today. I will just briefly share some words around Feminist Alchemy, the initiative that is behind the research we are launching today. Please check the chat for the links uh, of the research in English, Spanish, and French. We are very excited to present that to the world. So Feminist Alchemy emerged in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic in response to the needs for an organized and quality response among feminist funds to the needs of marginalized communities, recognizing that the world we live in is at the stage of continuous crisis with the rise of authoritarian regimes, uh, increased repressions of civil society, ongoing armed conflicts, genocide, protracted crisis, 
coupled with climate change impacts and that we need to learn better how to support the movements in such realities. That is why 15 national, regional and global feminist funds came together to understand what crisis means for the feminist movements that we support and how to better respond to it. We decided to learn together, we gather monthly, we hold circles of learnings around topics and the challenges we encounter along the way. And we also want to share with you what we learned like today, like what we're doing today. Uh, so today, uh, to better understand um, what feminist crisis response looked like and the strategies um, that the movements were um, using, we engage in a research process where we sought to answer the questions that my colleague Siwar just shared. This is what we will explore today through the voices of our incredible speakers. So just welcome to all and thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Bea. Um, so grateful, mm -hmm. so honored to, to see this journey, this beautiful journey that is Feminist Alchemy. Um, so we'll start by some questions to dive into really what does it, how does it really look in practice? What does it mean? Uh, so uh, first question will be for, for Lourdes uh, from Ward Marsh of Women Macronorte. Question for you, Lourdes, is what does crisis mean to you and your organization and your, your community? Muchas gracias compañeras, un saludo a cada una de las y los presentes en esta sala, eh, contenta de estar aquí, eh, definitivamente para nuestros pueblos, las mujeres y la Pachamama, eh, históricamente hemos pues, atravesado múltiples crisis, ¿no? pero en las últimas décadas se han ido agudizando y apareciendo eh, otros escenarios que atentan nuestra continuidad histórica como Pachamama, como mujeres, como pueblos indígenas, campesinos, rurales en nuestros territorios. Eh, como Marcha Mundial de las Mujeres Macronorte de Perú, nacimos dentro de esta complejidad de múltiples crisis, por un lado enfrentando el extractivismo minero, agroexportador, petrolero, de hidroeléctricas, eh, vinculado a las violencias múltiples contra nuestros cuerpos como mujeres en territorios donde el fenómeno del niño es recurrente. Entonces, desde ahí, eh, como feministas comunitarias y populares que vivimos en cuerpos, territorios, tierras concesionados, explotados por el extractivismo patriarcal, capitalista, colonial, entendemos que las crisis que vivimos una, son múltiples y hasta permanentes y son consecuencias de estos sistemas de muerte, ¿no? Son provocados por estos sistemas de muerte. Históricamente nos hemos ido organizando, eh, articulando de formas autónomas, comunitarias, para resistir, responder y proponer frente a las múltiples crisis. Y estos han sido vistos como una oportunidad para generar los cambios en nuestros territorios, en nuestros pueblos, en nuestras comunidades. Sin embargo, estos sistemas... Eh, pues eh, capitalistas, colonialistas y patriarcales, ¿no? Nos traen falsas respuestas ante las crisis mediante las respuestas humanitarias, al ser consideradas respuestas inmediatas, no se fijan en el tejido social existente, entonces nos traen asistencialismo, desestructuran nuestras organizaciones comunitarias y de base, y muchas veces se, se ven enfren, enfrentadas nuestras propias organizaciones eh, nos vemos enfrentados entre hermanos y hermanas por un pedazo de pan. ¿Y qué decir, pues, de las mujeres, que somos las más expuestas eh, y mayor trabajo asumimos en los cuidados en estos contextos eh, que se han vuelto cotidianos, ¿no? Creemos que las respuestas frente a las crisis deben colocar como una prioridad eh, el granito de organización, que sean las propias organizaciones quienes reciban los apoyos para, y sobre todo también organizaciones de mujeres, porque somos las mujeres las que estamos en contacto directo con el cuidado, con la vida, con la sostenibilidad, con la naturaleza. 
Entonces, eh, es importante considerar este rol, pero sin que implique también mayor carga para las mujeres, ¿no? Por eso es importante el tema de la organización eh, en estos contextos de dictadura que hemos vivido en el Perú. Eh, hemos sido eh, partícipes del apoyo del Fondo, uh, del fondo de Ayuda de, del FAO, y nos ha permitido entender justamente la importancia también de que realmente eh, puedan eh, generar procesos eh, flexibles, ¿no? Porque también entendemos que las crisis al ser múltiples y en un contexto también pueden ser cambiantes, se agudizan, mejoran, empeoran, pero el centro de todo esto tiene que ser la organización. Eh, creo que ya mi tiempo está culminando, me quedo hasta ahí por el momento. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Lourdes. Thank you so much. And yes, I think it's a, a great segue. As well. I think it's a great segue as well, like to, to go to the next question of why is it important? Why is it important uh, to define crisis differently? Um, knowing that building on what Lourdes was saying about the compounded effects of crises uh, a bit. So I would like to address this question to Muna from Tewa. Muna, why is it important to define crisis differently? See what Muna is having problems logging in, so she is not yet here with us. Okay, so I can also, uh, this is also like, I can also ask this question to Susan. Susan, why is it important to define crisis differently? Disculpe. Eh... La, ah, ya. ¿La pregunta va para mí o va para alguien más? Sorry, I was just fixing my um, interpretation. Yes, of course, it's, it. you know, the region that I work in is some um, experiences, crisis, um, different forms of crisis, right, that are not necessarily always recognized as, as crisis. Uh, we experience protracted crisis. So we have, you know, uh, one of the, the Swana region and especially the broader MENA region, for example, is one of the regions that's experiencing a great deal of conflict. Uh, pretty much uh, most of the countries in the region, I think in the MENA region are experiencing some form of conflict, Yemen, Palestine, Sudan, um, Lebanon, Syria. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a kind of, crisis that I think is very well recognized. But when that, you know, Libya, for example, Libya, Libya, I think is a very good example because a lot of people glossed over Libya very quickly. It blew into crisis and then they just moved on to the next one, which was Syria. So I think we have this tendency to focus on crisis when it's the worst um, example, but then forget about it. But that crisis is really protracted. You have different stages. And all of these countries, whether they have full-blown crisis, full-blown conflict or not, are experiencing some form of crisis. And I think in our region, it's really important. And for funders, it's really important to recognize that there are different forms of uh, crisis. For example, authoritarianism is a huge crisis, especially for women's movements and um, for women human rights defenders, because oftentimes authoritarian governments work with uh, conservatives to push back on women's rights and to also um, uh, push back on civil society. A country like Tunisia, perhaps many people don't see it as a country that's in crisis, but it's definitely in crisis when it comes to civil society and feminist movements because women are getting arrested. So I think it's really important to look at crisis um, in a different way and to recognize and to, and to be able to support both feminist movements and women human rights defenders who are suffering, who can't do their work, but who are also paying a huge price um, in terms of crisis. And what we do to support um, women human rights defenders and feminist movements and women during crisis is, first of all, we have a a process of prote protection for the individual women human rights defenders. So we campaign around their cases. We have, you know, I think many people who follow the MENA region recognize that this is a region where women are getting, if, even if they don't have equality, they have equality in terms of their backlash. So they're getting huge sentences. Uh, Salma al-Shahabi has received 27 years prison sentence. Um, in Saudi Arabia, for example, Sharifa Mohammadi in Iran, who is a labor rights activist, has received a death sentence. So this is major crisis. It scares other people 
organizing. So what we do is we try to support women human rights defenders. We campaign around their cases, raise awareness, provide protection, um, accompany men, try to get them, uh, facilitate their access, um, facilitate their access to funding um, when they're at risk to ur urgent funding. We do that. And we also protect and support women CSOs. I think um, we heard about the importance of organizations in this region. We don't have a long his, I mean, we have a long history of civil society, but we don't have very vibrant civil societies um, So, uh, because of an authoritarian system. So we support them, we build capacity, we support them with funding, accessing funding, um, learning opportunities, South-South exchanges, learning from one another, from their peers, providing them access to international fora where they can advocate for their own causes and their own issues and speak to their own issues. We provide them um, networking opportunities. Um, and we also do this, we provide them with opportunities, communities of practice so they can learn from one another around the issues that they work with. And lastly, um, what we also do during crisis in this region, we not only monitor what's happening to women's groups and women's civil society and feminist movements, but we also monitor what's happening to women. Um, because as civil society is pushed back and is facing crisis, or even when we have crisis, we see this um, in terms of women's loss of rights and um, uh, social status and safety and increased violence against women. So we try to monitor that. And we also um, give opportunities for women human rights defenders and for feminist movements to speak about these issues at the international level so that they can continually define what crisis means to them and how they can be supported. So I think that that's really key is to, to really listen to the women and the feminists in these countries. And when they call out and say, we're in a state of crisis, we have to recognize that and see where we can step in to support. Thank you so much, Susan. And how is it important as well when we look at it from like a regional, a com different context, different context, sure, it's just very different landscape, but there is always uh, the common need to ensure to really prioritize uh, the support uh, for women and gender non-conforming people everywhere. I also, so this is this is the strategies that Filina is, is like, um, like responding to crisis, these are some of the examples. Um, I would like also to go to back to Lourdes to ask, why the support from a feminist fund was key in your response to a word in crisis? Claro que, eh, claro que sí, compañeras. Eh, cuando nos organizamos nosotros dentro de los procesos de lucha, de resistencias y de organización, eh, nos dimos cuenta el rol protagónico de nosotras las mujeres, ¿no? En todos los procesos de las luchas, en todos los procesos de las luchas de la vida y del tejido de la red de la vida. Sin el aporte de las mujeres... Eh, no se sostiene ni nuestras comunidades, ni nuestras familias, ni nuestras comunidades, ni nuestros territorios, ni nuestro país. Sin embargo, históricamente hemos sido eh, escondidas, negadas, eh, y que lógicamente eh, legitimar el aporte de las mujeres pero de las mujeres feministas organizadas, porque somos las mujeres feministas las que tenemos una propuesta política que hace la diferencia a otro tipo de organizaciones. La apuesta y la propuesta política de transformación y de cambio. Entonces, al ser ese, eh, el proceso implica justamente una orientación hacia dónde vamos. Nosotros hablamos del camino hacia el buen vivir, de nosotras como mujeres, de nuestros pueblos y de todo el territorio, de todo el territorio tierra, ¿no? Del planeta. Entonces, partiendo de esta lógica, entendemos la importancia de que, y hablamos justamente, ¿no? De que eh, las mujeres nos organizamos y nos articulamos. No existe la lucha de mujeres solas, sino organizadas. 
¿no? Eh, y que estamos con una apuesta política, por eso somos eh, organizaciones de mujeres feministas. Eso, eso compartir, compañeras, brevemente, ¿no? Gracias. Thank you so much, Lourdes. Um, I, and yes, completely, feminism is also, it's, it's a very political uh, to support feminists who are defending the rights of those who are marginalized and the intersectionality of vulnerabilities. Um, thank you so much for giving that example and giving that lens. I would like to go to Tina and ask, how does your fund respond to crisis, Tina? Sorry, thank you, Siela. Um, so I would like to start by saying that uh, Uhai resources sexual and gender minorities as well as sex worker movements in Eastern Africa to address structural ma marginalization that our communities faced, be it in physical and online spaces, but which could also be uh, private or public spaces. So our response is anchored in supporting our communities to build their, uh, to build communities of care through having radical hope. It is also about um, supporting our communities to be prepared for um, crisis because for us in our context, crisis is continuous. Um, we support our communities also in various ways, which I will uh, summarize. Uh, briefly, but um, the key point is uh, our communities are taking action to create an enabling environment for us to determine our lives, for us to um, live and to thrive, even though um, the crisis seems to be ongoing and that we never seem to see the end of it. We do this also in recognition that people from our communities carry with them other identities that are normally different across um, different realities. Um, for example, um, trans sex workers working on the street uh, have different different needs in terms of security and other needs from those um, the same trans uh, sex workers who are working on online platforms. Uh, Biplus women with disabilities have different ex experiences of accessing, for example, sexual reproductive health care um, and other uh, public um, services from that of other queer women without disabilities. For, for us, therefore, responding to crisis is about putting into practice radical care that is also um, supported by love that recognizes the uniqueness of each person's story within our community. So in as much as uh, we are sexual, uh, we are members of sexual and gender minority uh, communities as well as sex workers, we have um, other, we have unique stories that bring into um, the question of how we are also being uh, supported to address the crisis that we are continuously um, working towards to address. So UHAI uh, does what is called participatory grant making. And um, this also can, you can learn more about this in the report um, where we give also some models for feminist crisis response. Um, so these, as I have mentioned, is all about supporting our movements to build resilience, um, resilience to um, also continuously, as they continue to advocate for an enabling environment we are also working towards the well-being, increasing the well-being of our communities. So um, increasing or providing access to affirming healthcare, education services, as well as opportunities to be economically independent. And we can see examples of this, for example, um, in Tanzania, where um, I would go back like around nine years when uh, the Magufuli presidency was just beginning. And it was also around the time when the first wave of the Anti-Homosexuality Act um, in Uganda was being felt because that is when it has been it had been passed. And so we were seeing that a stagnation of um, the movement, the growth of the LGBT movement in Tanzania that was also affected by what was happening in Uganda at the moment. And um, UHAI support through providing general support grants and um, flexible core support funding enabled our communities in Tanzania to continue building um, the movement. And in that way, the momentum was not lost. Um, I would also like to speak um, towards how we facilitate movement building. 
Um, this is largely towards uh, supporting our movement to and our partners actually in, in all seven countries of our support to convene. Um, and what normally happens during this convening at national and community um, level is around uh, first and foremost, um, just facilitating peer to peer support. Because as I said, um, all our partners who are operating and like just pushing back against further violation of the rights of our communities in the crisis context. Psychosocial support is, and, and also mental health is a big, big, big aspect of how we also center care. Um, what this looks like um, quite um, specifically, for example, in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, we have um, mechanisms that are enabling us to continuously strengthen partnerships with our members who are there. This is a vast country that is also marred by um, civil uh, civil war and also pockets of resistance, but our communities have been in, have been able to continue um, building the solidarity within this context, and it has also been um, through the support of being um, enabled to engage in accountability mechanisms such as the universal peer review, which. Um, also just facilitates uh, national level advocacy in terms of um, advocating for an enabling environment. In Burundi and Rwanda, we also see how compliance as uh, community-based organizations is, is, is something that um, is, is being seen as an avenue to avoid undue attention from the state. Um, in Tanzania, we have been seeing increasing um, crackdown on sex worker organizations, but also LGBT organizations. It is becoming increasingly um, difficult to, to organize in the usual ways across um, all the countries of our support, and therefore convening takes um, a different form, and it is also supporting the continuous um, building of the mental endurance that is needed by our communities and any um, any any people who are members of any structural structurally excluded community to continue resisting because um, any 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 um, all those people who uh, manufacture the crisis in our context they are always working you know and 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 they always seem to be a step ahead and so um also as a movement funder um i would like to take this opportunity to call on to other funders to also um start thinking a bit excuse me excuse me to start thinking a bit up outside the box in terms of how um movements can be supported to be able to adapt more quickly in terms of how they are also responding to crisis in their in their in their context, um, in terms of also institutional strengthening, this is another area that we have seen um, and we have also learned from the pandemic, the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, Uhai has been building its endowment fund because we also realized that in order for our movements to be supported to continuously grow and to continuously build their resilience to push back against um, any, any um, like for example, the anti-gender and anti-rights uh, movements, we need to have our, our financial health as an institution needs also to be solid because Uhai is the first funder and only funder to many nascent organizations because um, of also how the philanthropic landscape is is structured in our in our in our in our context, um, we also support our movements and our partners to build um, their strategies around community resource mobilization. Um, we have, for example, collaborated with our partners on donor cultivation and um, engagement initiatives that have also served to celebrate the meaningful work that our partners have been doing in terms of uh, continuously enabling the strengthening of uh, redundant healthcare systems that also um, more specifically have been instrumental in ensuring that much needed healthcare, uh, healthcare services, including psychosocial support have been reaching those who need to be reached. Um, and I would like to 
conclude my 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 contribution by also speaking to um our contribution to building the knowledge base the no the knowledge base of 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 just feminist practices around how um movements that are continuously and communities that are continuously um like trying to hold hold back i mean push back against further advancements of violations of their rights how can we be supported on one hand to continue learning even as we um take action in in context of crisis but also as uhai as a feminist uh funder we are very much um uh, prioritizing uh, how to learn more innovative ways of moving money in highly restricted contexts um because for us we are not an emergency funder but because of how um the crisis operates in our region we have also been forced to uh, respond to emergency requests what does this mean then in also a context where um participatory um uh, mechanisms not only participatory grant making um but participatory decision making processes where we are learning together and deciding what we would like to use that knowledge um to further our 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 resistance um yeah so um in terms of also furthering the resistance i would like to give a very specific um example to conclude um about how we are supporting our movements in ethiopia to discreetly organize um using digital platforms this is a highly restricted um um context where even the internet and digital platforms are being used to surveil um activists and which with with dire consequences but that has not stopped um our movements our our partners in Ethiopia from also finding other ways to 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 continue meeting because convening is showing that it, it it's it's proving and uh, it's proven and there's also evidence that we are co-creating uh with our movements on how just sustaining the 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 capacity and the ability of of activists who are responding to emergency um um situations it is important for them to keep meeting and not to be isolated because it is at the end of the day also about um supporting healing justice within movements of people who are already traumatized because of the criminalization aspect of 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 their lives but who are still taking action to ensure that uh, there's still some protection for the rights and and uh, of their communities as well as um there is hope for building communities that are based on justice love and care thank, thank you, you so much tela that's very very powerful and it just shows the complexity not only the crisis but also the ways to respond and what it means for feminists to respond in their, in their own way uh, and in their own pace and as such as very important for feminists for us to continue supporting feminist grassroots and for that i would like to ask the final question to suzanne which is how can donors better support your work what do you recommend suzanne Thank you very much. Thank you, Tina. I think um, a lot of what Tina mentioned is really true for our region as well. I know we have different forms of crises and different a different context, but a lot of what they're doing makes a lot makes sense for us, and it's also what we need in this region, not just Femina, but all of our partners in the broader Mina region and the Swana region. Um, I want to pick up on a couple of points that Tina mentioned that I think is really important. I mean the women's movements in our region are working in in like as i mentioned before in in different forms of crises that perhaps is not always as regularly recognized you know we have terrorism we have extremism we have authoritarianism we have war we have um conflict we have occupation um and we also have disasters um and so it's really i think the issue of care is really important um to support the care of activists um, we recognize that there's not enough 
uh, trainers and provide, you know, or there are a lot of people, but perhaps they don't recognize their own capacities or their capacities are not recognized. We just recently held a regional TOT to train activists who are providing or somehow engaged in providing care so that they can provide this to the region because it's desperate needed. Many of the women human rights defenders and feminist activists are traumatized themselves and they need this kind of support. So providing that kind of financial support is critical, but having it be indigenous from the region is also absolutely critical. Um, as I mentioned before, recognizing funders should recognize the ongoing and different nature of crisis. Um, authoritarianism is a huge issue um, in our region. And so funders have to recognize that people organize in different ways when they can't organize, when they're prevented from organizing. Tina mentioned that there's a lot of um, online organization. Yes, that's what happens when the ability to come together, to establish organizations, to come together three or five people is criminalized Then people go online. And the way that people organize becomes informal. Uh, we see this, for example, in the case of Afghanistan, where um, the civil society has been, you know, has is in exile, but new groups are emerging and they're organizing, but they're informal. They don't have registration and recognizing that supporting those groups, those emerging groups that are responding to crisis that's especially in the case of Afghanistan, it's unheard of. It's un, it's, it's not, ex, it's never been experienced this level of crisis that women and women's groups are facing and really seeing how they're organizing and supporting that. Sometimes civil society in a context like that, maybe two people coming together or one person speaking online. So recognizing that and valuing that and supporting that is really important. Um, it's, um, uh, critical, critically important to also provide, you know, as I mentioned, care and wellness, but also opportunities for solidarity, for networking, for convening. Uh, a lot of times funders wonder why um, uh, activists want to go to conferences. I know feminist funders don't recognize, do understand the importance of convening, but these may be the only opportunities that these feminists have to engage with with um, decision makers and to really speak about their own issues, but to also engage with their peers and stand in solidarity with one another and to recognize that they're not alone. That oftentimes in this region, a lot of the feminists feel very isolated. So breaking that isolation is key, not only in terms of concepts of care, but um, for them, giving them opportunities to learn from one another, but also to speak on their own behalf so that, you know, that they also feel empowered when they talk about what they're doing. This is this is critical and they feel proud of what they're doing, because when you're isolated and you don't get that feedback, you feel like you're making no progress. We have to what we battle in in around the world, but in this region in particular, we may never see the results of on a date on a, a, within our lifetime. And oftentimes when, you know, in, in this region, when you're fighting just to keep, just to keep what you've, what you've accomplished, just to maintain the rights of women or prevent backlash or prevent back further backsliding, that's not measurable. You can't measure that. Um, so I think that funders need to really recognize the complexities in which these feminist activists are working and to be flexible in their funding. Tina talked about responding, allowing movements to respond. If groups are together, even if they can't necessarily engage in any measurable action, it's critical to keep them together, to provide that flexible funding so that they can maintain their groups so that whenever there's a little opportunity to act and engage and push forth for women's rights or to respond to, to crisis or to respond to, to needs, that they can do it. Because reorganizing and coming together takes a long time. And that's something that we need to see from feminist funders, that they are committed to maintaining civil society, especially in these highly um, securitized and difficult contexts to work in. For example, from the Women Life Freedom Movement, it's not, it's not that women just rose up one day and decided to say enough. This is the result of you know, 20, 30, 40 years of work by the women's movement to raise this awareness. You know, of course, Iran. There's not a lot of funding and there's not a lot of support, but really I think it's a clear example about how um, 
uh, women's movements, the results of their work, you know, it takes sometimes takes decades. And so that long term commitment is a really that long term and flexible commitment is a really critical. And lastly, I think what we need from funders, um, and this is actually really important because from from government donors, but then also from independent funders, because they have access, they can do advocacy on our behalf or alongside of us. They can influence policy at a level that perhaps we can't. This region is a region that suffers from sanctions, terrorism designations, it has a financial crisis, it has banking issues, you can't transfer money. And the, you know this hurts civil society and it hurts feminists and it hurts women. So they can engage with governments to try to address some of these challenges that make it extremely difficult to get money and support to feminist groups on the ground. Um, also, I think it's important for um, feminist funders, especially independent funders, to engage with governments and to advocate for women human rights defenders who face huge risks to their lives and to their freedoms, and to um, identify and set up relocation programs. We're having these issues not only in the Swana region, but also in Latin America, where a lot large number of women human rights defenders are forced to leave their countries where nowhere to go, and there are not enough schemes um, so this is absolutely a critical need that we have, that we can work in partnership with funders. And lastly, I think for this region, and perhaps this reverberates around the uh, global majority, the global South, is that um, universal rights are um, universal rights are universal. Accountability should also be universal. It's that we need to hold violators of human rights accountable, no matter where they are and who they are. And um, we in this region rely on the UN system and international human rights mechanisms. It's our mechanism as well. We rely on it to push against violations of rights by our governments. And if those mechanisms are weakened because they do not support human rights um, everywhere and they do not hold accountable violators of human rights everywhere, then we suffer collectively, all of us suffer. So I think it's really critical, um, especially with the emergence of feminist foreign po policy, um, it's critical to really hold governments accountable um, and funders, independent women's funders can help us do that. So in cases like Sudan, Palestine, and other countries is to make sure that um, uh, human rights mechanisms and human rights law are um, applied systematically and consistently so that what we're saying and what we're doing has value and legitimacy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, thank you for that very comprehensive, complex uh, understanding uh, of crisis and also how to respond to it. Um, also, thank you so much for giving regional uh, perspective to that because uh, it varies and we're very very lucky in this conversation to have different regions covered here but we're very sorry that Tewa was not able to make it um, because of some technical issues uh, but we're happy that our partners our colleagues are covering really all of the questions and I want to go to the Q&A right now and I would love to receive we would love to receive more of the Q&As as well like as we go along uh, but there is I want to Give this question to um, Lourdes, a uh, question for your feminist group that was founded in 2000 and mining conflict territories of Peru. And your group was founded to promote better living alternatives for people and living communities and nature. I will take the question of Josephine that is in the Q&A and ask you, what would you describe and define a feminist humanitarian response uh, and what are the approaches just generally for your context? How, what is, what is a feminist humanitarian response? Thank you. Gracias por la pregunta. Sí, nosotras eh, vivimos en territorios de conflicto extractivo. Somos, eh, Vivimos en los pueblos eh, donde nuestros territorios están concesionados. Nuestra organización articula a eh, organizaciones de base, organizaciones de comunidades indígenas, campesinas, rondas campesinas, 
eh, mujeres jóvenes, eh, mujeres lesbianas, demás, en territorios de conflicto extractivo, ¿no? Es nuestro, nuestro principal eh, eh, trabajo, pero que en estos contextos de eh, eh, territorio también existe el tema de la lucha histórica de nuestros pueblos indígenas. Eh, recientemente, como ustedes eh, tendrán conocimiento, pues eh, vivimos ahora un contexto de dictadura, ¿no? Y en este contexto de dictadura nos eh, dimos cuenta de que nuestros pueblos indígenas eh, históricamente seguimos siendo reprimidos, invisibilizados en este país. Tomamos Lima para hacernos visible, pero vimos la, el racismo, el clasismo, la colonización hecho carne en nuestros cuerpos, ¿no? como mujeres y como pueblos indígenas también. Eh, entonces la violencia se agudiza más para, no, para nosotras. Entonces, nuestras luchas eh, no solamente se fundamentan en resistir, sino también en que queremos cambios, ¿no? Nos organizamos para construir procesos de cambios y transformaciones para nosotras como mujeres, para nuestros pueblos indígenas campesinos y para nuestro país, para el planeta, porque nuestra nosotros decimos, estamos aquí en nuestros territorios defendiendo la red de la vida para todos y para todas. No porque la naturaleza sea, sea una mercancía, porque lo necesitamos a la naturaleza, sino porque la naturaleza también es un ser vivo. Nuestros cerros, nuestras aguas, nuestros ríos tienen vida, tienen espíritu y merecen existir al igual que nosotros y nosotras. Entonces luchamos justamente por esa libertad de todas, todos y todes. Y con esta lucha histórica que llevamos a cuestas, queremos eh, construir procesos, apuestas políticas, que lo hacemos en nuestro cotidiano. Entendemos que para nosotras, nosotros la autonomía es importantísimo, pero también somos conscientes que cuando hay ayudas que agilizan esos procesos de cambio, porque nos permiten movilizarnos, nos permiten encontrarnos, nos permiten hacer incidencias, nos pedir, permiten también, eh, ahora nosotros decíamos en el Perú hay un problema histórico, los pueblos indígenas de la, del sur, del centro, del norte, llevamos más de 200, más de 500 años de colonización divididos, entonces no hemos logrado encontrarnos, estamos pensando, eh, tenemos una lucha en común, pero estamos pensando distinto, ¿no? En el norte decimos no queremos extractivismo en nuestras eh, tierras, no queremos, nosotros hablamos del buen vivir, de la convivencia armoniosa de las mujeres, de nuestros pueblos con la naturaleza, pero hay otros eh, también que sí hablan más bien de negociar eh, los minerales, de negociar el litio. Entonces, no hemos debatido el proyecto en común como país que tenemos como feministas, como mujeres, como feministas y como pueblos. Entonces, estos apoyos eh, definitivamente fortalecen, eh, pero también siempre con ese recelo de decir hasta dónde estos fondos de apoyo son buenos para nuestras organizaciones. Ahí viene el tema del debate de la dignidad. ¿no? Si en algunos fondos me va, va a hacer daño a mi organización, mejor no lo recibimos. Y esto también tiene que ver porque algunos fondos son muy, muy, eh, no son flexibles ¿no? en el proceso, porque las crisis, como ya mencionaron las compañeras, son múltiples, diversas y que constantemente cambian. Hoy estoy enfrentando un proceso de derrame, por ejemplo, en nuestros territorios, de derrame eh, de cianuro, de derrame eh, eh, de diferentes minerales que afecta la vida, nuestra salud, nuestro cuerpo, pero mañana ya estamos enfrentando otra crisis también que requiere atención, ¿no? Eh, un enfrentamiento, un conflicto ambiental, hermanos que están siendo perseguidos, perseguidas. Eh, entonces, son múltiples, ¿no? Eh, los diversos, por ejemplo, tenemos nuestras compañeras de, de, la, de la Asociación de Mujeres Unidas Somos Una Fuerza que están enfrentando, eh, están enfrentando justamente la contaminación de sus aguas, están contaminados, pero mañana viene el fenómeno del niño. Entonces, están en un territorio de fenómeno del niño. Entonces, son múltiples los procesos que estamos en resistencia y se requiere de la flexibilidad de estos fondos 
y que entiendan los procesos, pero también que estos fondos lleguen hacia organizaciones feministas y organizaciones, otras organizaciones también, pero particularmente nosotros desde el feminismo comunitario y popular hablamos, que lleguen para acá para que esos fondos realmente puedan ser dirigidos hacia las personas que los necesitan, eh, sobre todo las organizaciones, garantizar que a través de la organización eh, no generemos eh, mayor asistencialismo, que es uno de los temas centrales que siempre hemos venido cuestionando, que hay fondos que hacen daño y otros fondos que fortalecen nuestras organizaciones, nuestras comunidades, y que dentro del proceso de respuestas rápidas, de emergencias, se puede construir y fortalecer organización y así sostener nuestros procesos de lucha también. Tenemos experiencia nosotros en estos contextos. Muchos dicen que no, pero nosotras decimos que hemos surgido dentro de estos procesos, eh, nos fortalecemos dentro de estos procesos y construimos y generamos mayor organización dentro de estos procesos, porque los fondos vienen y van un tiempo, pero nosotros, nuestra vida estamos aquí, enfrentando la muerte día a día y necesitamos tener autonomía y sostenibilidad para estos procesos. Eso quería compartir, compañera. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Lourdes, and thank you also for covering. I think what you've shared right now actually answered a lot of the questions in the chat, the complexity, the interconnection the deep history that connects and how the response needs to be aligned to that complexity, to the land, to the people, to the most marginalized who are there attached to the land. They are the ones who are facing, they are the ones who are affected the most and they are the ones who are defending the most. I would like to ask the last questions. We only have like five minutes left and I would open it uh, to, uh, to either uh, Tina or Suzanne And the question would be like, um, how do you as funders ensure that the organizations that you fund also fund sustainability beyond the existing funding cycles you have with them? I can go. Yeah, please go. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, for me, I would uh, like to also um, ask another question, how could we talk about sustainability of um, the work, for example, that our communities are doing without speaking about the criminalization aspect? Um, so for Uhai Beyond, for example, um, also supporting our communities to um, build their economic um, independence through, for example, um, having setting up income, various income generating activities, um, to name but a few. It is also about um, building thought leadership around how we approach the, the element of building um, sustainable communities of sexual and gender minorities as well, as well as sex workers. Because the very people who are meant to be um, One moment, hello. Who are meant to be um, responding to our needs as 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 um, our leaders, for example, are the same people who It's are so um, shrinking the space for us to express ourselves. So this is also a question that we are continuously learning um, about around um, internally as a feminist fund, but it is also to um, leverage our position as as a movement funder to also um, enable. Of um, increased efforts by our Holy partners, partner. community mobilization efforts. Thank you. And can I just comment on that as well? So I'm not speaking from a funder perspective, but as a grant recipient. And I think when crisis happens, all of a sudden, when this full blown crisis that gets a lot of attention, whether it's humanitarian or otherwise, a lot of funders become engaged and, you know, you look for certain organizations and all of a sudden you have this influx of funding, um, uh, but it's for a short period of time. So the organization gets bigger, but it that it's, it's life is not necessarily sustained. So, you know, making commitments for longer term funding or providing funding with flexibility that can be spent over a period of time. Because so I think what happens if, if you get funds from a number of uh, funders and you're not able to spend it, then, then you're judged and people say that the funders say you don't have the capacity to necessarily do it, right? 
Um, whereas I think many organizations would prefer to uh, spend that funding if they can over a longer period of time, recognizing that crisis is just not that one instance where um, it's full blown, that it's ongoing. So really looking at longer term funding, three, four years of funding and allowing flexibility to those um, grantees to spend that money over a longer period of time as they see fit or as they're able to really respond better to the needs of the community. Um, that can help with sustainability. But of course, sustainability is a huge issue and a huge challenge for everybody in this space. Thank you so much, Tina. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Lourdes. Uh, thank you all for, for this insightful, insightful conversation. I invite all of you to download the report. It's shared in the chat. Uh, we are have been really working very hard as a, as a community of practice, Feminist Alchemy, to do the research, really, really learn, learn together, collaborate, of thinking how what is crisis and how to respond. And we are so honored to have this insightful conversation, such an expertise, great expertise. And at Global Fund Forum, we trust really trust our partners to tell us, to let us know what are the issues and how to respond to it. And that is what we um, are really proud of and we would love to continue. We, I would like to highlight all of the, uh, what was mentioned about the flexibility, the need for flexibility, the need for long-term support, the need for deep listening, also broadening what the meaning of crisis and leaving it to really the the marginalized groups who are in communities to define what crisis is for them and also to define what are the crisis response strategies. Uh, we, are, um, we are really encouraging um, everyone who's, who's really here today to advocate for feminist lenses to crisis response and humanitarian response, to advocate, to center the most marginalized uh, life experiences, lived experiences in the center of adopting and crafting, designing the responses, processes. Uh, that is the only way, and we cannot really, um, we cannot really uh, talk about uh, like uh, equity, equality, if we're not really centering those who are the most marginalized. We really hope that we're not putting bandages, not only just giving relief, which is very important, and we are but also to look beyond the structural deep root causes of the inequality, of the marginalization, of the oppression. And we hope that together we work to build a better future. And we're very, very, very honored to be part of amazing feminist actors around the world who are working diligently to have a better future for next generations because this is a long game. This is generations work. This is not one generation work. Thank you so much for attending. Grateful to have all of you. Uh, please download the report. Please um, engage in making this conversation more um, common. Thank you so much and have a great day wherever you are. <laughs>